Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, author Calder Walton on Russian spies in reality and fiction. Vasily Matrokin was the KGB's archivist, and he set his mind to the fact that he would compile a private archive of KGB records, which he would one day hopefully reveal to the world. The Russian services today, like their Soviet predecessors, are the, the sort of the world's leading spy masters. But some of these staggering successes were actually owed more to the dedication of the agents than the masterful tradecraft on the part of the Soviet and Russian services. Putin's threats about using a nuclear weapon, a tactical nuke. If he does this, it's going to just fundamentally change our entire understanding of post-war international security. Calder Walton, welcome to Chatter. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And it's great to have you here. I've wanted you on since we've started this podcast because your work has intersected not only with some of my interests and past career, but also you do a really good job in your public conversations about intelligence history of linking it to pop culture and the popular imagination to make sure people understand the context of this thing you have made your your life's work. And I really appreciate it. And it fits chatter really well. So thank you for joining us. Oh, it's really wonderful to be here. And that is a that's a theme, uh, certainly, as you as you just said, David, of, of um, a lot of my work is uh, intelligence in fact, and in fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are crossovers between the two realms, of course. Um, but there are also major differences. So um, I'm afraid, from my perspective, it's not all James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good although thing. there are although although there are some some remarkable stories that you uncover in the in the archive that could be straight out of a novel or indeed a film um, you know we're, so yeah we're, we're going to get to all of these things in depth as we talk about the fact and fiction of uh spies in general but kgb spying in particular mm-hmm. uh, but i just want to pick up on that bond thing right away which is it's amazing the more i learn even now the more i learn about the history of the business of which I was a small part, how many things I saw in the James Bond movies growing up and other films that were just outlandish and crazy and could never happen. Uh, how much I realize, yep, you know, most of those really are. Most of those really are absurd and ridiculous and they might look good on screen, but they don't really match with reality in any way. And yet I discover that there are those things I'm like, well, except for that one, right? That yeah. thing which seemed absolutely crazy. Um, yeah. Not James Bond splayed out on a table with a laser about to cut his crotch. Not that one. But a lot of other things I realize, wait a minute, consciously or not, that does pull on a real story about an exfiltration or about an assassination or about a ridiculous mechanism set up for a brush pass. And there's... There's a lot on both sides that the more you learn, the more you enjoy the other side, the fact and the fiction. I think you've just summarized it really well. There's um, the two the two different aspects complement each other. Um, and as long as you start watching a James Bond film, knowing that it is uh, fiction um, and you can appreciate and value it for it, a good story. But at, at the same point, at the same time, uh, some of the underlying issues that are addressed in, in the Bond books and the films um, have a kernel of truth to them. Um, so the nature of um, espionage, how, how one person's hero is another person's traitor, uh, the gadgets, yes, at key points uh, in its history, we can now see that MI6 really did have laboratories uh, where they were working on new gadgets that they could give to their officers. There really was someone called Q Quartermaster. Um, so it it... There are elements of truth uh, that, of course, Ian Fleming knew, um, and then he wove a picture, uh, a sort of inflated picture about the image of James Bond. He had to do it for practical reasons, that when when Fleming was was writing his books and the movies were coming out, <laughs> it, it seems crazy to think of it now, and it's particularly crazy given the U.S. perspective. Um, 
Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service, MI6, didn't officially exist. The British government right. didn't avow its existence. Mm-hmm. So, and there were strict, uh, the Official Secret Act meant that people who, were, who wrote about it and discussed it could be prosecuted. So Fleming, did, for very good reasons, he wanted to stay out of jail. Uh, had to embellish the, <laughs> yeah, had to embellish the truth uh, when it came to MI6. But mm-hmm. uh, the 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 crossover between the realm of of fiction um, and fact. There's another side to that that I would like to that that sometimes I see um, historical uh, dramas um, about, particularly the, I mean the area that really I know best about is the British intelligence history, um, and they're wonderful depictions. But but then the for whatever reason the director the scriptwriters sometimes take it that step too far and they add in an, an extra wrinkle um which isn't the reality and I, I i'm sometimes left just wondering why did they do that they didn't need to make it that much more convoluted there's one i mm-hmm. think it was the your listeners will correct me but it was the the film about the breaking the enigma code maybe it was called enigma maybe it was called the imitation game i can't imitation remember off the top game, of my head right. It was probably the imitation game. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, they went one step so far. Um, it was basically discussing the existence of one of the KGB spies at right. Bletchley Park. This was John Cairncross. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the end of the film, they said, oh, no, actually, this was a – or they suggested this was actually a clever British plot to make to make Cairncross seem like a – I guess he would be a triple agent. You're like, e- No. You don't need. I mean, actually, the stories that uh, that that story and then more like it are so good mm-hmm. that you don't. They, they 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 write themselves. They are effectively made for Hollywood stories, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't need to then go that one step further and embellish them for the whatever reason for they that, do that. The parallel for that, in my experience, was the the film Argo, which mm. overall was was a very good film. And in large part stuck to, not entirely, but through much of the film sticks to the basic lines of, of yep. what happened. And I'll yep. give them artistic license to drop certain details and to add a few conversations and embellishments. That's, that's what a movie is. Uh, I, the listeners can't see me at this point, but I'm sticking two thumbs up saying this is absolutely right. I mean, my, Except, my, 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 the end. my the airport yeah. scene at the end just takes it in a comically bad place. And it was completely unnecessary given the magnitude of the moments right before that. That's right. I, th- I think my, um, my yardstick for or what I aim for um, with my own historical work is to use documents to bring together a story um, that I hope um, sticks to the the truth as I can establish it, um, but also uh, is exciting to read. And I think that the, the I think the Argo, as you just said, that's a really first class um, effort, both on the part of the CIA and the filmmakers. Yes, certainly there are elements that we can argue about. But but here's the thing: if that film inspires somebody to go and read a a book about it, that's great. And that's I've just I've just written a review of um, Christopher Nolan's brilliant film uh, Oppenheimer, right? Um, and we could perhaps post that David on the on the link to this. But my my own view is that yeah, certainly there are inaccuracies. Okay, fine. And mm-hmm. it's the easiest thing in the world for a professional historian to take pot shots sort of thing. But the depiction and to motivate people to get interested in the history, if that film. Uh, motivates people to go and pick up the biography of mm. Oppenheimer uh, and actually read about it. fantastic job done people I think most people do have a uh, uh, most people do realize that when they go to see a, a movie uh, as opposed to a documentary there are going to be elements of poetic license of artistic right. creativity right. so let's not let's not not every not everything in the film um, or in it, in the in the written word needs to be a slave to the facts. There are possibilities to get people interested in it. I think the um, ultimate in example of this in in recent pop culture, something that broke through to the uh, ultimate mass public, 
was the play Hamilton, which took great liberties with its source material in terms of form of presentation, certainly, but in other ways. And yet I understand that it led to uh, immense sales for the biography of Alexander Hamilton written by Chernow and other examinations of Hamilton, which I I call that a win. Absolutely. Uh, that you, you and I were thinking along similar lines, because that was the next one I was going to say as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Well, let's let's go back a few steps, Calder, to to how you got here. You mentioned your work as a historian, um, but you weren't, you know, born fully produced from the head of Zeus as a historian. So what's the path that got you there? I understand that obviously you're trained as a historian, but also that you worked as a barrister at one point. So please explain, first of all, to the American audience, uh, how a barrister is and isn't just a lawyer in the American parlance. Um, and then how you got to intelligence history as your core work. That's right. Well, um, thank you for asking that. It's, it's looking back on it now. I've been in this field of research for 20 years now. Um, I was actually a medieval historian by training. So, um, you know, Latin and, um, knights and medieval kingdoms and so on. That was my bread and butter. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I read the Matrokan archive by Christopher Andrew, um, just as for fun, you know, it was all over the newspapers and I, and I give us a a few words on what that is for people who don't know the story of that archive and how it came to the West and to be published. The Matrokan archive, the story of it is simply one of the most remarkable stories I know of about how a history book can be written. So Vasily Matrokin was the archivist in the KGB's first chief directorate. That's its foreign intelligence branch. And in the um, 1960s and 70s, um, he became, well, particularly after 1968 and the crushing of the Prague Spring, he became increasingly despondent with the regime that he was a part of and the, the agency, the KGB, that he was an archivist for. And he set, to, he set his mind to the fact that he would compile a private archive of KGB records, which he would one day hopefully reveal to the world in, in, in the West. So what he started off by doing was to um, write down um, the, the sort of the annotate and, and write down the records that he'd seen during his working day uh, when he got home, remembering them. And then he then he realized that actually, um, when he was leaving the building, the ar- the archive for the first chief director, nobody was really checking him. So he started to simply take the documents home and copy them out. And this began a year long process by which he would um, copy out documents uh, and then hide them, particularly at his countryside retreat, um, his dacha outside of Moscow. He'd hide them in old milk churns in the in the garden. Well, cut, uh, cut a long story short, this extraordinary um, archive of foreign of Soviet foreign intelligence um, material, um, Matrokin saw that his moment ke- was coming as the Soviet Empire was disintegrating, and after 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, he went first to the Americans. It has to be said, uh, uh, who you know, in fairness to the CIA, were inundated. This is a in somewhere, we don't exactly know which station, although I believe it was in one of the Baltic countries, um, inundated with um, requests from ostensible defectors, uh, you know, who were willing to be selling their, 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 their hitherto secrets to the CIA. So in fairness to the CIA, it was easy to overlook, but this is, I, I think I'm right in saying, and I probably uh, still has some blushes on CIA officers to this day, one of the great oversights. So what did Machokin do? He went down the road to the British, <laughs> who were a bit more reckless, <laughs> and, and said, this looks like an extraordinary opportunity. Cut a long story short, MI6 um, exfiltrated both Machokin and his archive to the West, to the UK. Um, it was of operational significance uh, for most of the 1990s as, as uh, case officers, as you can imagine, trawled through um, all of the leads. The FBI called it, with the, when the FBI, FBI was indoctrinated into it, they called it, I think, the, the single most important 
source on counter espionage ever to have uh, come the way of the FBI. Mm -hmm. Words to that effect. Um, And then it became the basis of two brilliant um, books by Christopher Andrew and Vasily Matrokin, Volume 1 and Volume 2. So so to get back to your original question, I read this in 1999 when it came out. I just thought this is an extraordinary uh, story. It's mesmerizing to, to read. The, um, the grand scope of history, you can see play along with some of the details, but some of the details themselves are just remarkable. That's exactly it. And again, to your point about um, sort of fiction, the stories write themselves, the characters who you meet along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I met, I emailed Christopher Andrew and said, look, I... I'm just blown away by this as an opportunity to uh, do original research and um, would love the opportunity to work with you. Well, again, cut another long story short. Um, that led to a master's um, at Cambridge and then a PhD. When I was, it must have been very early on in my master's degree, uh, Chris Andrew was appointed to become MI5's authorized historian. Right. So this is something that, Again, in terms of fact and fiction, uh, something that for, I think really the U.S. government um, is slightly missing a trick on. Um, the, the U.K. government, for all of its history of secretiveness when it comes to its intelligence services, ha- has been remarkably good at getting independent academic historians in to write the histories of their agencies. Uh, and and therefore um, revealing to the broader public what they do uh, in fact and then what they don't do in fiction. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. MI5 has written its 100-year history. Mm -hmm. MI6 wrote its history uh, for the first 40 years and GCHQ has written it. Exactly. And I I think, to be honest, I think uh, CIA um, is missing an opportunity to do that because the thing is, their history is going to get written one way or another. So, you, so the, the agency can either right. have can have help write it, or it can be written by people um, that are only looking to highlight uh, abuses and, and failures. Anyway, to get to get back to the, your your original question, uh, when Chris Andrew was appointed uh, MI5's official historian, he said he asked, "Would you would I be interested in some part time work on that history?" Uh, and I was like, this is too much of an opportunity to pass up. So that, that led to six years of research, part-time research, helping to write that official history. So uh, that really wasn't uh, a, an opportunity of a lifetime, to be honest. So, so what, what, what was, and I, but thank you, actually, I appreciate uh, you telling that, not only because it gets us to mention Christopher Andrew and his groundbreaking work uh, in so many subfields related to this, but... Um, but also brings us to how how you came to the topics you've been working on now. But you did not close the loop on the barrister side of things. <laughs> yeah, that was it. You're absolutely right. So after I did a PhD in postdoc, I published uh, my first book about the end of the British Empire and British intelligence mm-hmm. uh, called Empire Secrets. Um, and I'd always had a uh, an interest in the legal profession. Um, I enjoyed the idea of being, I like the idea of being in court, being a litigator. And in England, that means being a barrister, although it solicitors, the other branch of the legal profession are increasingly also doing that. But um, so I took the opportunity, I said, well, if I'm not going to do it now, I'm never going to do it. So trained and and in England, it's a much more, um, it's a much quicker route. You don't have to do three years right. of, um, of law school and it's far right. less expensive. I should also hasten, I also hasten mm-hmm. to add. Um, so trained as a barrister, did a pupillage and worked for four or five years as a, uh, a barrister, which I'm very grateful for the experience of doing. But I also uh, realized that my passion doesn't lie with, um, <laughs> I mean, some of the cases I, it's, it's funny how, how things go full circle. Uh, some of the cases I did involved um, ru- one Russian oligarch suing another Russian oligarch in an English oh. court. So it's interesting how things uh, go around. Anyway, uh, I realized that that wasn't something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, but instead, history is my passion. So I saw this uh, a fellowship at the Kennedy School. I took a massive pay cut, and I've never been happier. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
<laughs> it allows you to do what what you want to do and you know, it, it, like like any, I, don't, I don't i don't know if you you feel the same way david but i feel that anyone doing what we do is um i'm basically paid to do a hobby i would like to be doing this anyway <laughs> talking about intelligence reading right. reading intelligence books so it's a it's a it's a it's a wonderful um it's a wonderful area to be doing research in um there's a lot of mis misconceptions about it um yeah. and um i i'm really excited about um what what will hopefully come next in my career it's one of those subfields where i feel man maybe maybe i just don't know enough people studying intelligence although i think i do yeah you do I, i'm trying hard <laughs> to think of somebody who doesn't enjoy their work that is who who doesn't find themselves just kid in a candy store about digging into archives or doing interviews and it doesn't matter what period it doesn't matter what slice of intelligence history it is and maybe i'm i'm inadvertently putting down other fields although i'm not not trying to but i don't get the same sense that everybody is absolutely loving what they do in so many other areas as intelligence perhaps for the reason you cited which is you can clarify very prominent public misperceptions fairly easily with with some good research in a way that say right. if you're studying you know medieval history there aren't as many yeah. widespread public misperceptions that that the historian is digging down and, and and publicizing but i think also it's it's the exploring the unknown um in so many fields of study you're exploring the unknown that's part of the the enterprise but in intelligence it's almost working at two levels you're discovering the unknown about what was unknown even at the time and that that yeah. makes it both a little bit harder but a little more rewarding when you put yeah. together some materials from archives and other sources i think i think you're absolutely right david and i should also say that uh for me because you asked my own sort of personal journey um the moment when i decided uh, um that perhaps uh law uh, wasn't for me in the long term it actually coincided my unfortunately my dad got very ill and that made me think a lot about how fragile life can be uh and that actually this the, how important it is um when at some point i'm looking back on my my life and my career to do something that you feel um passionate about uh so that was a big a big motivation for me um it's funny though that uh, increasingly uh, what i see <laughs> intelligence history we are we have the happy problem of now we're having so many records that you barely know i mean you know and you don't even need to travel like you did a while ago you, you probably remember with the declassified cia um record system at the national uh at college park you used to have mm -hmm. to go there log on to their sp special term well now it's all on the cia website so even though they've rejigged the website that's a whole separate story it's not the most user friendly anyway it's a lot more user friendly than you know, finding one of the two terminals that's available in College Park, that, Maryland, and hoping that, you'll have access during the time that it's open. That it's still better than that, that. It's still better than that, exactly. But but what I what I do think is interesting, though, or what it, there's a resonance here, actually, of there are we have so many records that it's difficult to know where to begin with. But there are still mysteries within all within those records. The dossier, the British intelligence dossiers. They are far from the complete picture. And so actually, I think that there's an element to which my training as a medieval historian is still relevant for this, because what are we trying to do? We're trying to weave together incomplete data sets uh, and come to some sort of overall conclusion. It's made all the more that <laughs> the difference between um, medieval history and intelli modern intelligence history um, is that, you know, you are dealing with secrets that someone somewhere has an answer to and so there's this continual quest to sort of say oh maybe i can uh, uncover what they've been deliberately trying to withhold and of course you don't get that in if you're studying medieval history or even other areas of, of modern history there's uh far less m motivation um, there's a, there's, you don't have to contend with the fact that there are professional, uh, weeders of records that are right. trying to, um, keep particularly sources and methods, um, mm -hmm. out of the public domain.
And that's fair enough. You know, that's, there are things that I don't want to know about. I should not know um, about things that will engender current sources and methods. I don't think it's anyone's place to know that other than the professionals. Um, but then sometimes one does read the records uh, and you think, okay, there's inconsistency here because mm -hmm. on one page a name has been redacted, then there's a copy of the same record and the name's there. And you're like, oh, okay, that, why did you bother to read that back on the foot? Anyway, yeah. you know, it's, it's an imperfect science. Well, thank, thank you for the, the background on your own story and how you got to, to hear. You, you mentioned some of your previous published work, but we're speaking not long after the occasion of your publication of the, I'll call it a tome, because it is a hefty piece of work, and it is yeah. Spies, the stop. Epic <laughs> Intelligence War between East and West. And it is a remarkable book. I have finished listening to it in its entirety oh. as an audio book, and I have the thank hard you. copy as well. Um, it It is and will stand as probably the standard single volume covering the history of espionage between the, the West and the East in the last hundred years. It really covers that scope very well. It's not all about Tolkachev or the Cambridge Five. There have been deep dives on each of them and others, but yeah. putting them all together with, with a framework and a theme that makes it approachable to the general reader, it really is a remarkable piece of work. So I want to compliment you on the effort that it must have taken to, to pull together everything that went into that. What was your biggest challenge in doing it other than pure volume? Oh, well, first of all, thank you, David. I think everyone, my my wife and son, <laughs> will <laughs> will be the first to say we're, we're all very mm -hmm. glad it's done. <laughs> and it is a tome, as you said. What's the biggest challenge is how to um, bring this huge amount of data uh, together. Uh, there are underlying themes uh, that, that that go like threads throughout it. And any one of the problem is that any one of the cases that you that I looked at could quite easily have become books in themselves. And so how does it was a really difficult balancing act between um, covering what I knew was important to cover for readers so that so that they don't get a uh, warped sense of the history um, but, and at the same time, not going so far down into the weeds that you lose people um, other than a few very niche um, scholars. So right. it's, it was a very difficult balancing act. Mm -hmm. The um, What's been the biggest challenge? Inevitably, um, the closer we get to our own time, the archival records dry up. And so I, I was um, relying heavily on interviews. Mm -hmm. um, that's... Uh, you know, there's, that's, that's necessary, you know, that that's part of the territory. Um, but again, it's interesting, uh, in, in light of my own work, previous work as a barrister, um, in court, and you, you know, the first thing you learn is that the people's answers depend on the questions put. Mm -hmm. And so memory, even with the best, uh, intentions, uh, is fallible. Uh, you know, the number of, Right. There have been some really remarkable case, uh, some remarkable studies about how um, people's brains work about memories and uh, the cognitive layering that people in the witness stand will say wholeheartedly, 100 percent guarantee you the woman who was crossing the road was wearing a red dress. I was standing there and then they're shown video footage and she's wearing a, a blue dress. How right. does that happen? It's about questions put. It's about memory, but so that and that happens, of course, when people are recalling events from twenty years ago, thirty years ago, and stuff. So I always try to ground my interviews in at least one document, um, yeah. or have uh, at least two different sources, mm -hmm. say confirming, not just be um, one source. And what's interesting so, about yeah. doing that at this time, I have to say, is you've incorporated into the book things that have only been declassified and released in many cases within the last year. And that yeah. changes things. I've read books about the Cambridge Five and references to Kalinsky and Gordievsky and all these people before. And yet I was learning new things because I have not been digging into all of the new material that's come out in, in various waves, uh, including quite a bit in the last four or five years. 
And I appreciated that. So I like the fact that we're, in a sense, updating our own narratives and stories about what happened as we learn more about everything from, you know, the Rosenbergs to Alder James. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, there's now so much information that it's difficult to keep up, uh, up to date and keep up to pace. Um, the, I have to say, the UK National Archives, uh, it's just for, for any listeners who are thinking about graduate research projects, it is, they, they do a remarkable job of declassification and then full transparency on what they're declassifying. And a lot of the files that they declassify to do with intelligence are digitized. So one doesn't even need to travel to the, the National Archives in London. You can simply download them um, from wherever you are and work on them. It's wonderful. And it, it is, it is, and, and the dossiers, um, you know, compared to some of the the records that I uh, from other countries that I've I've used, the dossiers uh, from the early Cold War, the British ones, they are a real testament to the the value of the UK civil service. They're all meticulously filed, um, and they 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 tell it they tell a story. Uh, it's a and it, what's really, I, it's it still sort of makes me so excited to work with them is that it's the same files. I mean, if, if you do go there to the National Archives, it's the same files that the desk officers were using. And you can see the thumb pages and you can see where the file was, t- when it was taken out and who it was taken out by. So when they're investigating the Cambridge spies, you can see exactly who was looking at the file when. And you can see the underlinings. You can see the exclamation marks that someone's put in the in the file margins. Uh, it's a, and then and then there's there's also just the other thing is that it's not just um, if the, these files aren't just of relevance to people studying the history of intelligence. They're also relevant to people studying social history. Um, the intercepts of phone calls of targets of, of surveillance from national independence leaders in, in, in Africa through to, uh, yes, you know, the usual suspects in the communist party, but also just a constellation of different, um, political actors in both Britain and the empire in the 20th century. You've got, you've got intercepted mail correspondence where they steamed open people's letters. You've got, um, intercepted, um, bugged, uh, conversations. Um, so that was another thing that I, I tried to do, David, that your listeners, um, might be interested in. I, to, to get back to your original question, what was the, what was the challenge? What it was, if you like packing everything in. Yeah. And then what I decided to do was to actually, some of the things that I knew were wonderful stories, but they were tangential to the main thread. Um, I decided to build a website for the book and to put that, um, to put that some of those stories and documents onto the website um and so the we'll, websites we'll yeah, yeah we can we, that website that would be great and Make i put sure i put um, one of the things i uh, one of the things i i put on the website um in in czech uh czechoslovak czechoslovakian mm-hmm. archives the stb archives i uncovered got got released um uh, s- several dossiers of stb targets in the 1960s but they included um bugged conversations so it's really really eerie you can be teleported to conversations between two people uh or a couple people in a room that they thought were was private uh and the conversation obviously would have lost to history otherwise but here you are hearing um the private conversations in german and in czech between targets uh, of of STB surveillance, uh, it I mean this is the bread and butter of what intelligence agencies do, of course, as you know. But to actually hear it uh, is is, I th- is rather spooky. Let's just put it that way. I would think it would be hard, and I think it's hard for anybody doing archival historical research, but especially given the range of things you've talked about already it'd be really hard not to be seduced by the research. That is, to, to finally cut off digging in the archives and having that discovery, in some cases, page after page, transcript after transcript, um, and actually start writing and pulling it together. Yeah. You could have been doing the research for this book literally for the next 40 or 50 years. 
That's definitely true. It's also true that, um, you know, three quarters of the way through, I mean, the, 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 as with everyone else, uh, when the world closed down, um, it was, I was essentially halfway through the research for the book. And then we had two years or, you know, 18 months of archival closures. And that was difficult to, to put it mildly. Um, so then coming out of that, Putin's war in Ukraine, and that transformed the, the, the tenor of the book. It made it, on the one hand, much more urgent. I wanted to um, bring this story out as quickly as possible. On the other hand, mm -hmm. his, history was changing before our eyes each day. Yeah. And yeah. how finding that balance again between I was, especially at the beginning and the end, where you write something and then you're like, mm -hmm. well, actually, I don't know. And the biggest thing, David, to, I mean, the thing that still, you know, as with everyone, Putin's threats about using a nuclear nuclear weapon, a tactical right. nuke. He's threatened to do this. This was, he was making these threats as I was writing, finishing the, the, the book. Mm -hmm. um, if he does this, it's going to just fundamentally change our entire understanding of post-war international security yeah. and deterrence. Yeah. So it was, it was difficult to try to write um, about contemporary history uh, mm -hmm. in such a way that it wouldn't quickly become redundant uh, with changing world events. So, yeah, well, yeah. you need, you need not worry about that because having just um, taken in your writing uh, in audio form, I, I heard the, the many ways that links were made to I mean, literally to a hundred years ago with some things having to do with, with Ukraine and throughout this history of the ways in which history is echoing when it comes to Russian behavior with Ukraine, with in, in relation to Russian intelligence and how it operates and how we've seen that reflected in the last year plus. So I think you've done that. It's not a book about Russia, Ukraine, but it is highly relevant to anybody who's interested in, in getting a different perspective on the conflict through the lens of intelligence history. So we'll, we'll yeah. put that one in the positive column because I think it, I think it did work. I do want to drill down on a couple of these cases because, yeah. and obviously we can't and won't deal with everything you've written about, but there are some prominent cases of spies working in the United Kingdom and in the United yep. States for the Soviet Union or the Russians or both, depending on the, yep. the time frame, that we have a much more complete understanding of now than we did certainly 25, 30 years ago, but even in some cases, five or 10 years ago. So I'd ask i ask you to briefly tell the story of a few of these, uh, including what we now know that's different than what was certainly known at the time, or even the first draft of history as it was written. And I'd like yeah. to start with the Cambridge Five, um, perhaps as, as a unit, one of the most successful Russian penetrations um, of the, the allies, including the, you know, specifically the United Kingdom. Um, the person of Kim Philby himself, but those around him and all of the things that they did. Um, who were they in a nutshell and why were they so valuable to the Soviet Union early in the Cold War? Yeah. Well, the Cambridge Five, as you said, it's, it, this has been, especially in the UK, there's been a, an entire industry of books written about this and, and they are just, it's, it's on the one hand, uh, you think, Surely it's all been been said by now. And on the other hand, the records that are coming out throw a new light on this old story. So who were they? The Cambridge Five were five graduates of Cambridge University in the mid 1930s, who uh, the KGB's predecessor, the NKVD, recruited um, as agents um, and had the intention. This was unlike anything being done in the West at the time um, to. Uh, that they would join uh, the, the they would take the exams to join the UK civil service and get into sensitive positions of power. The Second World War was the moment um, that allowed them to do what they've been planning um, before the war. Um, Britain's intelligence services desperate for new recruits, 
and were effectively um, with minimal, absolutely, with hindsight, shockingly poor vetting standards. So if you knew somebody uh, and you had a, um, you know, that and that, that if you knew somebody well-placed and that person said, uh, he's a good chap, because generally uh, it was men at that point, um, and you went to the right school, you had the right accent, um, the doors are suddenly opened. Even if there are, uh, if there were uh, blemishes about Marxism in your in your history, um, this is there's on on the on the one hand, um, we can say that British security was astonishingly poor, so they didn't rely on proactive investigations into applicants' uh, backgrounds. And for many years thereafter, right? They they continued just to see whether there was a, a mark against them in the files already, and if not, they were okay. That was it exactly. Um, and on the other hand, it was a very um, skillful um, matter tradecraft by Soviet intelligence operatives to um, purposely distance themselves um, from communist organizations that would have led to those blemishes, as you said, in the records. So if you keep an arm's length from them, if you know that MI5 is looking at communist organizations in the UK uh, in the 1930s and you keep a, your distance from them, you don't, you don't join their mailing list, you don't go to their meetings, there's going to – the chances of there being a so-called trace in the records are, are fewer and fewer. And then if you're wearing – if you happen to be wearing the right um, university uh, tie when you go for an interview, the doors are suddenly open. So this, this, this is the story that's been that's been – relatively well i mean it's been well known um how they managed to do this the damage that they did to um, both british and u.s security during the second world war and then as the cold war set in it is hard to overstate um the, the the volume of intelligence that they were producing from the different branches of um the uk government and which had access to the u.s government as well um meant that effectively Stalin was effectively, as the Cold War descended at key moments, um, he was engaged with open diplomacy with his Western counterparts, though they didn't know it. So at these key milestones, um, you know, Churchill's um, Iron Curtain speech, the, the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, um, you know, these big milestones that we all learn about in 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 in, his, in history lessons at school, well, Stalin was actually receiving inside knowledge um, about them thanks to the Cambridge spies. Kim Philby, who you mentioned uh, during the Second World War, managed to become the head of the uh, department in MI6 that was responsible for countering Soviet espionage. So just to draw a red line under that, that meant that the person in charge of catching Soviet spies uh, in MI6 was himself a Soviet spy. I mean, it's history has few master strokes like this. That's um, it's it's such a remarkable stranger than fiction story. Just because of that, and obviously the things pertaining to that that were given to the Soviets. But to me, it's remarkable that other things that he had some awareness of. Yeah, like I believe you mentioned the uh, in Albania was it that there was the effort to. Um, get some operatives onto the ground in Albania and intervene. And he basically gave away the operation and locations to something that was not technically in his counterintelligence or whatever portfolio he had at the time. Yep. And yet it was, history would have been changed. That's right. So on the, uh, the, the level of destruction um, is now, I think, laid bare in the records that have been declassified. Um, with things like, for example, the defection of a Soviet cipher clerk at the very end of the, the Second World War. So um, the, the Second World War is over. Um, a, a defector in Ottawa in Canada uh, from the Soviet military intelligence, GRU, Igor Gazenko, he defects, um, bringing with him documents revealing to Western governments what the Soviet Union had been doing uh, against them during the war. And we can now see uh, in, the, in the records how Philby uh, in MI6 
tries to take over the entire investigation, even though it wasn't within his jurisdiction to do so. Um, and we, we, we know what he was really trying to do, which was to, to bury important information uh, and to manipulate the investigation from the inside. It really is, uh, I mean, the, the, the level of destruction. On the Albania, um, um, the rollback operations in Albania, um, there's historians are still trying to unpick exactly um, how those operations were betrayed, why they were failures. And I'll point uh, listeners in the direction of the recent work by Rory Cormack. Uh, he's a, um, a uh, brilliant uh, historian, UK-based historian. And he's pointed out, um, building on the work of others, that um, yes, Philby almost certainly betrayed those operations, but they were also, it has to be said, um, rather inept in terms of uh, security uh, on the part of both MI6 and the CIA, CIA themselves. So recruiting loose-lipped emigre groups to then parachute back in behind the Iron Curtain, uh, it's little, the, given the nature of who they were recruiting and their less-than-perfect security, um, it's, it's not that surprising that the operations um, were unsuccessful. And One that's thing, a polite way of saying they, the people, the agents parachuted in in many cases were eliminated by Stalin's secret police. So. And there's, there, there are a lot of, there's a repetition of that story, right? Across yeah. the Cold War in particular of cases where the spies gave something away, but it's, it's not clear that it would have worked anyway because of either incompetence or lack of political support or, or funding. Um, yeah. But to close the book on the Cambridge Five, uh, yeah. The one thing I came away from from your retelling of the the story with the new information yeah. is that I, I don't know how to phrase this, but it it fit into a theme that I think is generally true, which is that many of the spies working for the Soviets and the Russians across decades and decades, um, many of the best ones individually and collectively, were not recruited. As such, mm -hmm. that is, they weren't convinced mm -hmm. to work um, other than people like Ames and Hansen, um, who eventually got a lot of money, but but they weren't recruited by the Russians. So many of them were people that early on for ideology and later on for cash or ego basically yeah. volunteered and found a way to self-recruit. And it didn't take a whole lot of pushing from the Russians, which in turn tells you something about the KGB and the impression of the KGB as master spies who are able to manipulate people and get people to work for them, maybe they're just kind of lucky that at different times for different reasons, people wanted to get information to them and they just happened to run the assets, but they weren't necessarily the geniuses making all of it happen. What, what have I mischaracterized there? No, you haven't mischaracterized it at all. Uh, and that I'm so glad you phrase it that way. And I've asked that question because that is certainly the, the it it that is the impression that sort of just screams at you uh the more that you uh look at the history of this um so a lot of it is wrapped up in contemporary um politics within russia so russia's services um especially under putin for the last two decades have had a um an inbuilt um, tendency to valorize uh, the past successes of Russian intelligence. Putin, of course, being a former KGB officer, you know this is this is very close to his heart to valorize the the past successes. And it it, it it's not difficult to see that the narrative is um, the the Russian services today, like their Soviet predecessors are the, the sort of the world's leading spy masters. But to your absolutely correct point, and what I try to um, weave through the book, is that some of these staggering successes were actually, in the past, actually owed more to the dedication of the agents than the masterful tradecraft on the part of, of Soviet and Russian services. So um, one of the big correctives that I'm, I make in the book about the Cambridge spies, just to close that chapter, is that within the the Kremlin today's t telling of the story, um, 
when Burgess, the two of the two of the members of the network, Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, they defected in um, 1951, and and that suddenly you know, that a search was on for the so so called two missing diplomats, mm-hmm. Kim Philby, uh, who was at that point li- MI6 liaison officer in Washington D.C., he knew. Uh, which was at the so he was at the apex of that transatlantic uh, clandestine uh, relationship. He, Philby knew that his friendship uh, and affiliations with with Burgess Burgess had previously been living with him as a lodger uh, um, in in Washington. He knew that 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 proximity to Burgess would cast suspicion on himself. So what does Philby do? Well, in the Kremlin telling today. He stoically um, uh, restrained himself from saying anything uh, to British intelligence as he was um, uh, subject to interrogations. Well, that's a load of, excuse my friend, bollocks, I'll say. You found otherwise. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We can now see that in the immediate aftermath of the the, the, uh, McLean and Burgess defection, what does Philby do? He writes a letter to the head of MI5 and MI6 and he effectively throws them both under the bus. This was at a moment when I just to sort of underscore it, that the British authorities didn't know where they were, didn't know what was going on. A few people had a fear. They're like, oh, no, this couldn't be, they couldn't be Soviet agents, could they? Where are they? Well, Philby writes this letter, a tissue of lies, saying, um, I think they're probably Soviet agents. Um, there's good grounds. He said, you know, as, as, as his phrase was, as things have um, come come back to me over the last few weeks, I remember some facts about Burgess as he was living with me, which suggest that he may have been a Soviet agent. And in fact, one of them may have recruited the other while at Cambridge. Well, in fact, Philby knew uh, that he was the one who had been responsible for recruiting okay. them at Cambridge. So what was this an effort to do? It was to deflect suspicion from himself, throw right. them under the bus, um, and to, to hang on. Um what does it mean? It means that Burgess betrayed the British. Yes, we've known that. But he also betrayed a Soviet, fellow Soviet agents, something that the Kremlin doesn't want to uh, admit today. Yeah. And, this, and it, David, to your point, time and time again, uh, the, the infamous Cambridge, the, the Soviet atom spies. Again, mm-hmm. was it due to masterful um, um, tradecraft on the part of Soviet intelligence? Mm-hmm. I think not. I think time and time again, it's to do with the dedication of true believers or communist true believers who at times were throwing so much information from inside the Los Alamos Manhattan project that their Soviet contacts could barely keep up with it. They could barely process the information that they were that they were pushing. And then just to close the the, the circle on this um, at key points with Philby anyway, uh, in the in the in the aftermath of the defection of Burgess and McLean. As the search was on, what does Philby do? Uh, he reaches out for his handler in New York, his Soviet handler, desperately trying to set up a meeting. And where is the handler? Nowhere to be seen. Badly let down by by Soviet intelligence. So this was all um, then corrected in the KGB-sponsored memoirs by Philby that were published after he eventually defected. And this has been um, sort of resuscitated, uh, reinvigorated uh, under under Putin, um, mm-hmm. that Soviet intelligence is, has been this masterful um, intelligence. And actually, again, you look at the British records uh, and the US records, it is astonishing how close British intelligence came to identifying the Cambridge spies within a whisker. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it, it is quite rightly remembered as the worst breach, security breach on the part of the British government in modern history. But it wasn't like they were completely and utterly um, blindsided. It's that they were came agonizingly close. That's the way that I would look at it. It's absolutely fascinating that one, one interview that would have taken place earlier or one additional question during an interview that did take place uh, could have opened it up much earlier and it didn't happen. Of course, that as a historian, you're counterfactualizing there, but also the cases that were caught and the fact that sometimes it was that one interview or that one question that did expose something and you can play out, well, what if that person hadn't been through that process? And and that's a really important point because I think there's a parallel, David, with your previous 
profession and what historians do. So a, a good, uh, to my mind, good history tries to take people inside the decision making at that time as they were looking forward, right? So from from the perspective of people, actors at the time as the Cold War was setting in, uh, obviously it, this isn't guided by hindsight. They didn't know what had happened. They they had numerous future alternatives, which have been now lost to history. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the same, it seems to me, uh, when we analyze intelligence failures. It all, of course, how could people have been so foolish not to connect the dots? Well, actually, at the time, um, it were there were hundreds of other dots that looked like they were even more uh, blindingly obvious. Yep. And it's only yep. with hindsight yep. um, that the dots make sense. Mm. So uh, that, I think that that's a really, uh, that's a, that's a, that's something I try, I strive for to in, in mm. researching history. And I think it's an important parallel there when people are analyzing intelligence failures, that the mm -hmm. sort of the, the characterization of just connecting the dots um, often betrays uh, how events looked at the time to those um, that were having to grapple with those um, Absolutely. decisions. Absolutely. Uh, Calder, I do want to ask you about a, a case that is connected to the Cambridge Five. Um, and it's probably the case that if you ask the, the average American who paid attention in a history class in high school, maybe took a, a history class in, in college, but not on intelligence history or perhaps even foreign policy, but just U.S. political history, the one case that probably would pop up is the Rosenbergs because the, the case of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg is one that fits into a narrative as it's taught in American schools. But we now know something differently than the mindset as it was certainly when I grew up and afterwards. So were Julius and Ethel Rosenberg first, were they helping the Russians um, and the Soviets? Secondly, were they actual assets of the Russians? And how do you feel as a historian, having dug into it and seen all of the recent information about the punishment that Julius and Ethel received? Great question. Thank you for asking that. So on the first question, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, um, were they uh, Soviet uh, assets? Yes, um, they un unambiguously were. Um, Julius Rosenberg was more important, it seems, than his wife, Ethel Rosenberg. Um, we know this, David, uh, from the so-called Venona decrypts, which is a series of, of, of um, communications decrypted um, by the US government and the UK government uh, in the early Cold War. These are wartime documents, Soviet documents, and they reveal um, that Julius Rosenberg was indeed a Soviet agent. He had a code name. Um, the, the role that Ethel Rosenberg played is far more difficult to, to pin down. It doesn't appear that she had a code, a Soviet code name. And that is important, right? Because, because we do know from Venona and other archival yeah. sources that giving a code name did matter in the Soviet system. That's, that's right. Um, we, we should also hasten to add that, that, that I, 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 I forget the exact proportions, but there are still, um, a, a significant amount of Venona decrypts that have not been de, uh, decrypted. So does her potential code name exist in those possible? I think it's only fair to say that. Um, but certainly, um, her significance, uh, to atomic espionage has not been, confirmed or revealed any further by documents that were uh, made available in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the, 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 over, the, the headline to, that I would stress for listeners to take away is that her role was ancillary to jo Julius Rosenberg's. Um, he was unambiguously a Soviet agent um, who knew what he was doing and was helping to funnel uh, atomic secrets to the NKVD, to the, to the um, Soviet intelligence. Um, how does then th this make me feel about um, 
what happened to them. Well, I, I follow here the work of uh, the, the remarkable work by John Earl Haynes and Harvey Clare, uh, mm. two of the, the best historians about Venona and American communism. And they make the point uh, in their various books um, that if it's a it's a it's a tragedy in many ways the on so many different levels mm -hmm. the u s government knew from the Venona decrypts that Julius Rosenberg was guilty that he was a Soviet agent. The right. U.S. government right. couldn't produce that information in court. Exactly. So they had to find other ways of of of, of doing that um, through um, cross examination, tripping them up, and this was true of the Rosenbergs and true of other uh, Soviet agents. Um, if in a different world, if the Venona decrypts had been made available um, at the time. Would the Department of Justice have pushed for the harsh sentence against Ethel Rosenberg? Probably not. Right. But they, they, they threw everything at them with the result that, as we learn in history books, that they were executed. Um, reading their pleas for clemency uh, in the files at the Eisenhower, Eisenhower Library still sends shudders down my spine it is a it's a it's a tragedy on so many different levels it's a tragedy because julius rosenberg was definitely a soviet agent there are serious questions about the role of ethel rosenberg what would have would the would the department of justice have pushed for such a harsh sentence um pushed for the death penalty um in 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 circumstances where the Venona decrypts could have been made available, I, I think probably not. Um, so it's a, it's just one of, it's a, it's a tragedy. That's how I'll uh, I come to see it. But certainly reading yeah. the, the transcripts, David, of the uh, pleas and, and Ethel Rosenberg's letters uh, mm -hmm. to Eisenhower, it, it, it's um, yeah. really is yeah. horrendous. Let's um, let's talk about a case the the other side, which is a a Soviet spy uh, for the for the West. And I'm thinking here one great case that people don't know the story of. Again, most people in America hear about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's it's the one thing people hear more than anything else. The closest we've been to nuclear Armageddon in the world. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the role of Oleg Penkovsky is usually overlooked in the first histories and sometimes even in the slightly more in-depth histories. So briefly, who is Penkovsky? How did he come to work against the Soviets? And why was he at least important, if not crucial, to how the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, played out? Well, Oleg Penkovsky, within the specialized literature, um, you know, has been known about for, for a long time. But as you said, it, it does. it's strange that his role in history hasn't really permeated the more popular culture. Um, it, it's a story that has everything. Um, it has, um, you know, it has bravery, it has betrayal, it has ultimately death because he was caught um, and executed. Um, his story has been portrayed recently in the film The Courier, um, he's depicted by Benedict Cumberbatch. It's a good film. I recommend it. Again, to our earlier conversation, David, there are things, there's some inaccuracies in it. That's fine as far as I'm concerned. It's a film. If it inspires people to read a book um, about him, all the better. Oleg Penkovsky um, was a senior officer in Soviet military intelligence, the GRU, um, who had access to... Um, information about the Soviet uh, arsenal. He was motivated by, uh, uh, it's difficult to unpack his actual motivations. He was motivated by um, a disgust for the Soviet regime that he was part of. He was also, it's fair to say, his own career probably stalled um, and that he, he wanted to advance his career. He was perhaps thinking about life in the West 
Uh, and he was also motivated by money. He was a playboy by all accounts as well. Uh, so he was, he was, um, certainly had multiple affairs going on at the same time. Um, he's a complicated so human being, was, right? So we he want was a complicated human people, being. White hat, black hat, and sometimes people that, are people. That's exactly it. I think it never have more true words been said when whoever it is that said that defectors are often defective. Um, and that's certainly, um, <laughs> That's just, as you said, in a very neutral, polite term, he was a complicated individual. But the, the intelligence he had, the, the information he had access to from deep inside uh, the GRU archives became extraordinarily valuable, um, first to the British intelligence service, MI6, and then to the CIA um, as the world came closer to the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was actually arrested by the KGB um, at the height of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So scholars have debated uh, a lot about the, his actual role within the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the thing is, if you look at the um, U.S. intelligence assessments about Soviet weapons in Cuba, those assessments that were given to JFK and his XCOM uh, circle, uh, the National Security Council, during those 13 days of the crisis as the world yeah. stood at the brink of nuclear Armageddon, all of the most important assessments have a code name at the top, and the code name is Ironbark, and that's the code name for Penkovsky's intelligence. So in other words, and this is, and, and David, you know more about this being at the, 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 the coalface of this. One small little code name, easy to overlook in the records, actually symbolizes a colossal intelligence collection and analysis program below the surface. So that Ironbark code name was the code name for, for the information that he had spirited out of um, GRU archives. That information, including technical specifications about Soviet missiles, meant that when, as we as we all remember from history, when the when the U.S. government, through the CIA's um, uh, spy plane, the U-2, eventually photographed Soviet missiles in Cuba, the, the photo analysts were able to cross-reference what they were seeing in the photographs against the information that was available um, from Penkovsky's intelligence, Ironbark. And, and actually, that stamp at the top of the assessments given to JFK it was a sort of saying this is this has been cross referenced against the gold standard that we have it from our spy uh, on the inside. So whatever um, story, whatever, and historians have debated about the actual role, his motivations, what was he trying to do? That the reality is that those key documents um, were all uh, assessed against his um, his intelligence. One of the things that didn't, though, that I think, again, if, if you like, Penkovsky is not really well known within the history books when it comes to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, although when I went back and watched the film on the, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, 13 Days, what's striking, yeah. David, is that the beginning of the film, they actually say, we know from Ironbark, which is a very... Um, very specific technical, reference. Very specific reference. And and I think most people, most viewers of the film which are like will just pass them over and be like, okay, whatever. And it's only now yep. you know, and like actually they were they were really onto it, but they knew it. But but yep. here's the thing that I think is important, uh, and this is a picture that's far from complete, and I'm really laying the challenge down to other scholars. But the role of signals intelligence, NSA, um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, I've done my best to sort of um, illuminate newly available records about the role of signals intelligence during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, not least using NSA's declassified in-house histories. Um, but it seems to me that actually a lot of the emphasis that the CIA placed on Penkovsky may have been an effort by the broader U.S. intelligence community to try to get the message out that the U.S. intelligence community was actually uh, providing valuable information to Kennedy. It came from human intelligence, Penkovsky, 
But I wonder whether the emphasis placed on Penkovsky was a, if you like, a somewhat of a camouflage, also to um, reveal, uh, in all but name, other sources. In, in other words, technical intelligence collection from NSA, right. um, and the role of uh, NSA SIGIN during the Cuban Missile Crisis is a mm. is a is a field and a subject that I think deserves a lot more attention going forward. It's absolutely amazing that something that has been so studied and restudied still has areas for deeper exploration. It's remarkable. Well, the the the, the best uh, thing that we have in our favor is that um, bureaucracies and clandestine bureaucracies tend to be very apprehensive about letting their their documents out, right. and so actually we find that time and time again, and it, it's especially true, it seems to me. Um, with the signals intelligence, technical areas of technical intelligence collection, where, um, you know, lo and behold, oh, here's a, here's a formerly classified history of the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. that talks all about signals intelligence. Oh, that would have been really nice to know about <laughs> 30 yeah. years ago or something. So it's a, it, it's going to be the gift that keeps giving, it seems to me. Um, a couple of other more recent cases that seem to fit into this theme of the Soviets and then the Russians not being the master spy geniuses, but in a sense, being more reactive and perhaps lucky. I think about the cases of Rick Ames at CIA and Robert Hansen at the FBI, who, you know, Rick Ames needs some money and offers up some information to the Russians and then decides once I've gone down that road, I'm not going back and keeps doing it. And yeah. the Russians handle him, but there's nothing, there's nothing magical in the way they do it. And then even more so in the Hansen case and Hansen, of course, died recently in uh, Supermax prison yeah. for, for what he did. Um, yeah. But Hansen's yeah. case, he he was essentially his his own handler. He he didn't allow the, the Soviets to give him their equipment. He didn't allow them to, to tell him where to do dead drops or anything else. He was basically running himself because he knew both the yeah. Russian and the American side of counterintelligence pretty well. And in both of those yeah. cases, absolutely devastating for not only uh, American national security and Western security, but also for a whole bunch of assets in the Soviet Union, but not necessarily shining moments for Russian intelligence in terms of identifying, you know, spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting good sources. These were cases that just dropped into their lap, right? That's right, uh, which fits within the, the, the narrative that we've already been talking about. I think it's absolutely right. I think in the uh, later memoirs of of um, both Rick Ames and Robert Hansen's uh, KGB handler, um, he tries to suggest that I think it's Rick Ames um, had actually an ideological affinity for Russia. That's the load of nonsense. They, these were these were these were uh, mercenary uh, operatives interested in their own ego. Uh, interested, motivated to have a lifestyle that they didn't have, uh, and earning some earning some money, and to do as they saw, um, to do one one over, get one better than uh, other people in their agencies um, whose careers were um, uh, doing better than theirs was. So this is again like the Cambridge spies, devastating for U.S. Uh, national security it's a parallel with the cambridge spies in, in the case of britain but it also um the thing that becomes so clear looking at this history is that there's the initial damage collateral damage of secrets that a mole rick ames or robert hansen in the fbi had access to um and then trying to understand the damage done but then there's the longer term um chilling effect um, it seems to me on um, on agencies and the and the bureau. So, what does it say for uh, colleagues, people who thought they were friends with these these people, that they were in fact betraying all of them? And it also leads to very real um, cases where innocent people were accused of being Russian spies. I'm thinking of the case of Brian Kelly. A CIA officer um, who was um, um, accused of being uh, a Russian spy, um, who turned out to be Robert Hansen, 
Brian Kelly's um, went through went through hell uh, in terms of his own career in the CIA. From what I gather, he he never um, carried a grudge um, and understood that this was the inherently uh, awful reality of working in the espionage and counter espionage world. Um, but it lead it so that's a long way of saying it. it the, the significance of these cases, as with the Cambridge spies before, is not just about the the um, granular intelligence um, betrayed, secrets betrayed to Moscow. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about the um, then the collateral damage on yeah. people's um, yeah. faith in their agencies uh, and their recruitment capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So building on this theme um, of the, and you can go back to, you know, checkists and NKVD and perhaps GRU and KGB and now SVR and FSB. I think we've hit all yeah. the letters. Yeah. Uh, the fact that there's not a lot of evidence of certainly not prolonged, consistent genius level work here, that a lot of it is chance and taking advantage of opportunities. Um, but, but not this master spy narrative. Why is it then that so much popular fiction does seem to build on this theme? And I don't care if it's to some degree, a uh, Graham Greene, John le Carre novels, yeah. um, certainly a show like the Americans on FX certainly portrayed this much more uh, two steps ahead of everyone else. The, the chessboard being planned out, having having people in place who are exceptionally skilled at what they do, that makes for good narrative and good fiction, but it also seems to portray the Soviets and Russians as, as much more powerful than they are, doesn't it? I, I think that's right. I've been, I haven't, I'm afraid, Dave, I haven't got a good answer to this of why, why this public perception is the, is, is, is this way. Um, and there's something, first and foremost, there's something I think within Russian DNA um, that makes um, Russians both love the world of espionage and good storytellers about it. Um, and there's also a tendency in the West, particularly in Hollywood, that in any narrative, we need a good baddie, don't we? good baddie a baddie a bad baddie <laughs> and and that um the russian services you know fit the fit the bill uh, given their their past crimes i think one of the things that um we we talked at the beginning of our conversation about the matrokan archive and and how that revealed kgb crimes um to the world the thing, the thing that I've tried to correct in in this book is, you know, one can be forgiven for thinking if you pick if you read the Matrokin archive that its tentacles went everywhere, but actually, um, what were Western services doing about some of those self same operations? So that is the big corrective that I think um, I've tried to write with this book. Mm -hmm. Is that yes, for, formidable, and, and and the thing is, we're we're effectively arguing or debating about how Russia got to its end results of some extraordinary successes. So stealing the Soviet atomic bomb, the plant, the secrets of the atomic bomb, that mm -hmm. changed history. That yeah. is yeah. clear as day. One of the most remarkable successes in mm -hmm. espionage history. But what we're debating about is how the, the route by which they did so. Was it through tradecraft or was mm -hmm. it through, um, as you say, like opportunity of running with agents that presented themselves? So there's mm -hmm. a subtle and important nuance there. But we also don't want to, to, to forget the big picture. So Russia's services past and present have been mas absolute masters of disinformation. Right. Uh, they had entire industries churning out disinformation that they knew exactly how the, the levers to pull on in Western audiences of the kind of wedge issues in, in um, Western audiences in the U.S., race relations during the later Cold War, 
and then closer to our own time in the digital age, it continued to be race relations, Brexit and Britain, these, these wedge issues. Russia, past and present, has known how to exploit them. But that, that in itself, disinformation, is a good example of um, a bit more nuance being needed. Because if you simply look at the, 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 the volume of disinformation produced, the, uh, the, the levers of power that they were playing, one f- could be forgiven, as indeed after 2016, with, when it was revealed about Russian electoral interference in the US presidential election, that Putin is this master puppeteer yeah. uh, playing, uh, playing people on the world stage. And I, and I think it's a bit like the, it's the same nuance of understanding past successes uh, with espionage as we need that with understanding disinformation. If you simply look at the volume pr- of production, you don't ask um, the much more difficult question, which is what difference did it actually make? And, and inherently, Dave, the, the problem with that is the, why most people don't want to ask that is that it's basically impossible to, to answer. Uh, to, we will probably be debating for the rest of my life exact the exact uh, impact that Russian uh, electoral interference, Russian disinformation had on the 2016 election. It's unbig- unambiguous, clear as day, that uh, Putin ordered a active measures campaign to promote the, the candidacy of Donald Trump and to undermine that of Hillary Clinton. Did mm-hmm. that effort sway the election? I, I, I fear that's just going to be impossible to answer one way or the other. Um, it's, so, it's, it's so largely unknowable just because um, how can you determine it objectively from the outside when most people can't objectively determine what was the defining factor in their own vote, right? Because so, exactly. so many things feed on each other, create narratives, create stories, you have actual memories, as you pointed out earlier, of things that didn't exactly happen the way you think they happened. All of that That's is right. built into a decision to vote and yep. multiply that yep. by 100 million. Um, that creates a whole yep. lot of uncertainty in the variables. That's exactly it. And But that is the inherent, uh, to get back to some an word, that you, a word that you used earlier, um, that's what makes this subject so seductive and so interesting mm-hmm. to study is that there are layers of, you, you know, you have, on the one hand, you know that an operation took place, be it Soviet espionage in the atom bomb project or um, Russian active measures campaign targeting the 2016 election and the 2020 election, um, be it some um, But then within that, then there's a, there's a layer, shades of gray as to what the actual effect of both of those, uh, those were. And that's right. where I think it gets really interesting. Another difference that you you highlight at a few points in, in your most recent book that I think is not well understood is that the United States, and I would include here the United Kingdom and other allied countries, do one thing in their intelligence operations and their entire enterprise that is considered very important. It is, why do you collect intelligence so that you can analyze it and provide assessments to policymakers that help them make tough choices in a difficult and uncertain environment. That's the whole point. You don't collect intelligence for its own sake. You collect it so it can be acted upon by policymakers. The the Soviet Union and seemingly to some extent the Russians also had a different approach to analysis. Um, Personnel is policy. And I think you highlighted the fact that at one point there were around a dozen intelligence analysts in the KGB when the United States alone had many thousands across several agencies. And that analysis traditionally in the Soviet sense, we have some indication from Soviet and Russian sources that analysis was very much doing what is anathema to Western intelligence services, which is telling policymakers what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Talk through that a bit. Well, it, it seems to me it all stems from the nature of the regimes that um, in one party states, um, in the Soviet Union under Stalin, for example, um, his military and his intelligence officers had the very, very, very real fear for their lives. Uh, so in the, in the pre-war years, there was the, Stalin instigated the great terror, was mass purging and liquidations of 
his military and intelligence officers. So this was, to put it politely, to put, to put it sort of flippantly, not an environment in which an intelligence, this wasn't going to engender a situation where an intelligence officer was willing to challenge the views of um, Stalin. That's putting it tritely, to say the least. This, although to a lesser degree in the, in the uh, subsequent years, this continues on under um, different Soviet leaders. The, 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 the KGB's purpose was, even in the later Soviet period, to provide, quote unquote, loyal information or patriotic information that confirmed rather than challenged the worldviews of the Politburo. Right. Um, that's not to say that, that the KGB wasn't, didn't have in its files and didn't provide more robust an analysis, particularly in the later period, than other elements of the Soviet bureaucracy. But it was still confined within the, as part of the, the system that it was a part of. And we see, it seems to me, Putin's uh, regime is really a throwback to, in many ways, the Stalinist uh, regime. And we saw this, his, saw Putin's um, attitude and the way that he viewed foreign intelligence as clear as day before the invasion uh, of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where there was this bizarre, if you remember, this bizarre National Security Council meeting um, that Putin had. Um, and it was uh, televised uh, for the whole world to see. It was also pre-recorded, as people were pointing out, because people's, if you remember, watches were showing different times. But at any rate, one of the... Was this one the public the, dressing down of the official? This yes, one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This was the, pu the public dressing down of his uh, director of the, uh, foreign intelligence, the SVR, Sergei Narishkin. Um, and he... he, for, he be, it was pre-recorded, but but Putin decided to keep this public dressing down in the pre-recorded broadcast, um, which is telling. Um, who knows what was going on in the scenes that led to Putin doing that? But I think it's a safe safe guess to say that obviously Narishkin had had said something, done something to to piss off Putin. Was did he provide a, a more sober assessment? saying that actually um, the invasion of Ukraine is going to be a much more difficult thing than perhaps you uh, are um, banking on. Who knows? We'll, we'll know that maybe one day through a defector or through records, a new Matrokin, you know, we can only hope right. for um, right. from within the regime. But the, the point is, looking at that episode, it seems so clear that the same... Um, crippling sycophancy um, that we can see in Putin's court and what he demands of his intelligence officers um, that's, that fits within a long tradition going back to the Soviet period. So we seem to have this, a really striking throwback to the Stalinist period. Um, and, and, I, and again, those of us that sort of Russia watches, watching this unfold over the preceding years, one thing that was so clear was actually, and the trajectory of Putin's um, regime, one thing that was so striking was how Stalin re-entered into the narrative in the his Russian history books. So it's really a, a bizarre thing um, that the SVR director, who we just mentioned, Narishkin, also is the director of Russia's historical society. So <laughs> pretty messed up, right? Okay. Yeah. So that's like the CIA um, director being the head of the American Historical Association or something. <laughs> but but what you saw on the uh, in the in the preceding years, especially as the SVR um, uh, approached its hundred year anniversary, um, is that the um, hagiography, the the the, uh, the pamphlets that they produced. Um, uh, embellishing its past successes, what what you what you found is that um, some of Stalin's phrases were re-entering um, that right. the, those periodicals, those publications, in a way that wouldn't have happened five years, ten years before under Putin. 
So that that was a real trajectory of alarm for those of us that were watching it closely. Right. In terms of these fictional representations of Soviet and Russian spying, have you seen any that stand out to you as particularly good? I mean, I know some are wildly entertaining from the fantastical to those, but not the representations of real world events like Oppenheimer or Bridge yep. of Spies type things, but actual fictional, fictional representations like the Americans. Are there any that you find are uh, rising above the others in terms of either their representations of reality or their clever use of real world events? Oh, um, you already mentioned, David, um, the Americans. And I, I, I think it's a really fantastic uh, series. Um, it, it really um, takes audiences inside a semi-fictionalized or fictionalized um, life of Russian illegals. And the thing is, of course, the plot lines are, are made up and so on and so forth. But, but those operatives really did exist, and they do exist. And if that, again, to your point, um, if that motivates people to go and read about um, the Russian deep cover illegals network that was uncovered in the U.S. in 2010, uh, codenamed Operation Ghost Stories. So Gordon Carrera has a fantastic book about that. Highly recommend that. Um, or other deep cover illegals. Uh, that operated in the West in the earlier period of the Cold War. Um, I'd recommend the book um, by Trevor Barnes um, called um, Dead Doubles. Um, so if that series, The Americans, uh, which is a Hollywood treatment, but they had, they, they, they had some fantastic advisors uh, on the show, uh, and there are elements of tradecraft there that are absolutely accurate even if the overall storylines are, are embellished in hollywood i take i'll take your point there that the the trade craft and of course just the is there a word called historicity because there should be but the, <laughs> okay. the way in yeah. which everything in the background the television programs the books the clothes the hair yeah. they do a good job of putting it in period um yeah. it is shocking that you know just the pure body count the number of people uh, assassinated by mauled by tortured by this couple uh, just in the first couple of seasons, easily overtake the number actually done across any deep cover network in the United States in all of history. I mean, you compare the actual network that was wrapped up that you're talking about with the yep. ghost stories book. Um, yep. Nothing yep. close to what happens with this couple here. No, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and again, though, I, I would take my my yardstick is if it gets people motivated to go read about it or to listen uh, to them, I'll take it. That, that's, I'll take it. that's job done. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not one of these ones to, um, Fair enough. um, to the take pot shots at the historical right. accuracy of, uh, I, I think mm -hmm. when you're, when you're watching a, a show on FX or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you, you kind of, you know, that this is a dramatization, you know, that this is, um, yeah. Yeah. not supposed to be a documentary so that yeah i i really enjoyed the americans i have to say uh mm -hmm. even though there are of course bits of it that sort of made me go ah, you know why did you have to do that um mm -hmm. your other other um i mean although it's um it's not a movie depiction but in terms of books fictional book the, the I mean, to my mind graham green novels i just go back and back to them time and time again and his the way that he talks about intelligence and his particular his um yeah. depictions of characters you can it this is somebody who was an intelligence officer and his turn of phrase in terms of wonderful literature to read i just think you can't do better than graham green John Le Carre gets all the attention, but Graham Greene relatively um, oh. should should get more attention. I'll just leave it that way. I yeah. agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. I mean, in terms of just beautiful writing, I think you can't do better than than Graham yeah. Greene. Yeah. Well, our tradition is to end with a question from our so-called. Oh yeah, you told me this is okay. Mm -hmm. Now, now we're going to really get going. There we go. We'll see what it coughs up for us. 
Calder, uh, well, you've you've actually done this already a few times, but okay. who is someone in your field or a related one whose work more people should be following? Your oh, chance to shout a out one. a colleague. I think it's not it's not fair because I think she already does have a good following, mm. um, and it's not it's not fair to phrase it like that. But somebody who I have the most, I'll, I'll slightly rephrase the question if I may, which yeah. is who's somebody who you have a, a great admiration for, uh, and that's Amy Segart. Um, mm. And I, I think she's a she's an extraordinary scholar. Mm. Um, and every time she writes anything in the Atlantic, I pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Her her book Spies, Lies, and Algorithms, I think it's called, is really a the primer on how um, open source intelligence is changing the nature of. Uh, intelligence and national security in real time at this moment. Um, it, it's not fair to say that more people should pay attention to her because people already are paying attention to her, um, and quite rightly so. So Amy, somebody who I have just the, the, the greatest respect for. Happy to happy to have that recommendation for everyone. Um, Calder, thanks for being so generous with your time. I know it's a very busy time for you right now. And it was very kind of you to make time for us to chat. Thank you. It's been absolutely my pleasure. It's been wonderful to be with you. Thank you. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.